What can the African National Congress do to avoid a repeat of the Polukwane Conference in 2007? What delayed the consolidation of the ANC's branch nominations for the upcoming elective conference? And why are the branches of the ANC holding the key to the organization's top position? And will the December elective conference unite or even divide the ANC further? What time is it? It's question time. Good afternoon. Hello and a warm welcome to the show. I'm your host, Sim Piwe Ngoan, standing in for Mpo Tseidu. Now, the African National Congress's Secretary General, Greta Mandashe, has warned branch delegates against the dangers of selling votes in the party's presidential race. Mandashe was addressing delegates at the Western Cape ANC's Provincial General Council on Sunday. Now, the deadline for branch general meetings was extended until this past weekend, you know, to accommodate possible disputes. The ANC's elective conference in December continues to dominate headlines with only 19 days to go. The presidential race is said to be the most fiercely contested in the party's history. Some analysts are cautious about its success, though saying that divisions that marred the 2007 Polokwane Conference are likely to rear their ugly head again. With numbers of delegates per candidate already being bandied about, some have even identified Mpumalanga as a kingmaker province. Premier David Mabuza is yet to announce who between Dr. Nkosa Zanadlamini Zuma and the Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa has his backing. We are live, therefore you can call us and air your views on the following numbers. 089-110-4210 or the international number is plus 2789-110-4210. You can tweet us your comments. Our Twitter handle is at question time 24. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, my guests this afternoon are Mr. Tapelo Tilabedi from the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Johannesburg and Professor Susan Boysen from the Wirt School of Governance. A very good uh, afternoon to you too. Thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon. Now, Professor, I'm going to start with you. Now, this will be by far the most fiercely contested uh, election in the party's history uh, with uh, horse trading and smear campaigns at its most <laughs> intense and the divisions within the party, uh, you know, getting wider and more, you know, and more blatant. Are we likely to see a real incarnation of the Polokwane conference this time around in a more different form. You know, if you talk about acrimony and serious hostilities between different factions, I think it could very well be a reincarnation of sorts of the Polokwane conference. The big question is whether these differences that we see between the factions and the emphases and especially around the issues of state corruption and how to address it and whether to take a st strong stand or not about addressing it, that poses some very important choices to the ANC. On the one hand, the ANC wants to move on. A part of the ANC wants to move on. A part of the ANC wants to cover it up. And it is a very important question whether a compromise between these two positions is possible. We see in the last few days, quite a few in the last week or so, a new few initiatives like the President's Last Supper where he hosted the presidential hopefuls, all of them. And that is one initiative apparently to try to get unity. And President Zuma himself will be the greatest beneficiary of that kind of unity. We have seen both Nkosa Zandlami, Zuma and Saru Ramposa in the last week or so pronouncing, but people don't know whether they should take it very seriously, that yes, they will be able to prepare to serve under the other one. And we see a few other meetings across provinces taking place. On the one hand, it is just to make sure that this conference will run and will run smoothly, but then the ANC will have to face this very difficult choice. And we see from the electorate, there is a range of polls now, credible public opinion polls, that show that the electorate, ordinary voters, ANC supporters, are so anti the corruption, are so dismissive of the corruption that's been happening in ANC and in ANC controlled government. So the only way in which ANC will really have a 2019 elections future and be able to succeed in those elections is if they take a credible step now. And whichever of the candidates is prepared to take a very strong stand against corruption and in favor of uprooting corruption that we've already seen. Those candidates could um, benefit the ANC in the longer term. But so it's layers of choices that the ANC faces now. Yeah. 
Yeah, and we'll touch uh, on corruption in just a moment. Now, uh, Tapelo, will this conference unite or even divide the <coughs> ANC further? I mean, uh, some saying that uh, the Nkwazana Lamini Zuma camp has stated that uh, even if she loses, she will stay on in the party. But then Cyril Ramaphosa has not <coughs> made that pronouncement, sparking fears and concerns that uh, there could be another breakaway faction if the scale, I mean, if the, the scales rather, do not tip to his favor. Look, I think it's, uh, it's a very difficult conference for the ANC. Obviously, this would be the third time after Polokwane, where, you know, the, you know Polokwane and the Mangaung, there were factions that you broke away from the ANC, and there's a possibility for a third break away from the ANC in this conference. But I think the ANC is going, they're very divided, you know, when, 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 when people are looking at disputes in, in branches, they're obviously looking pol for political interventions, because obviously they have embedded interests in the outcome of those disputes. So I think already, given the nature of, of, of again, when it comes to accreditation, or whether who's the legitimate delegate and who's not a legitimate delegate as we saw in the Eastern Cape conference where literally half of the delegation just really just left conference or they were kicked out through the chair so I don't think there's a real possibility in this conference that th this conference may not sit if they're able to pass the issues around credentials but I think that's going to be a big issue because those stuff have, have come out in terms of disputes over whether conferences were actually set or the BGMs were able to sit and so on and so forth so I think uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure there's going to be unity I doubt I think there's going to be a much more bigger problem than what we saw in Polokwane for the ANC and and there's a possibility again for another breakaway so let, let's see what happens in, in the credentials I think okay. all right we've got the first caller on the line Felix a very good afternoon to you Thank you, thank you, my man. Thank you for taking my call. <coughs> I think the, yeah, I think the question we are not asking ourselves is this. United for what? What is it that ANC is supposed to unite for? Because unity is not just in a vacuum. You don't negotiate between lies and truth. There is no, there, there's no negotiation between light and darkness. When light comes inside the room, it doesn't negotiate with darkness for the darkness. Will you please be able to go out of the room? Please, I'm begging you, let's negotiate 50-50. Light stay half of the room, darkness stay half of the room. It doesn't work like that. If there is light in the room, darkness disappears by, by default. So what I'm trying to say is this. ANC are not looking at what is going on. They cannot see the elephant in the room. They cannot see the lies that they are living through. They cannot see that Jacob Zuma has totally destroyed that, that party. And they want to negotiate with him and his, his factions so that he can, he can go on living as if everything is normal. That's where the problem is. ANC is dead. And that's all that matters now. All right. Felix, thank you so much for your call. Well, that is Felix there from uh, Null Sprite. He's basically saying that uh, unity for what? All right, uh, we are live, and you can air your views, and you can call us on 0891104210 or plus 27891104210 if you're calling from uh, outside the borders of South Africa. We'll take a short break now, and question time. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Celebrate joy with Reds. Let's go, let's go, UG. You got this, man. Let's go, buddy. You say it, you say it. Just let's go now. Come on, come on. Two weeks earlier. What do you guys do? We do IT. IT? Yeah. That's great. Share a castle, make some new friends. Finally, getting the click in Corsa right. Mowing the lawn without mowing the cable. When your washing machine gives you all your socks back. With so many good deals at the tops at Spa Silfest, you'll find any reason to celebrate. Get this case of 24 Lion Lager 500ml cans for only $199.99. Only at the tops at Spa Silfest.
Welcome back. You're still watching Question Time. My guest today are Mr. Tapia Lotzelapede from the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Johannesburg and Professor Susan Poison from the Wirtz School of Governance. And uh, before we enter that ad break, we had a caller, Felix, who was basically saying that uh, unity cannot exist in a vacuum. What are your thoughts on that? No, I think it's actually quite right. What is the basis of unity inside the ANC, and especially when people make the calls for unity? Are they perhaps signaling that they're you know, ready to welcome the outcome of the elective co conference, regardless of that outcome, whether it's NTZ winning and then the Cyril um, campaign are willing to accept that? Or, or, or are they anticipating what, what might happen at the conference? And, uh, so, so I think there has to be a basis for unity, whether it is the radical economic transformation policy of the ANC, which I think still needs to be knitted out. What is the basis of that unity? But I think what is quite clear that there's still going to be a lot of struggle around the issues of corruption and so forth when it comes to government post the elective conference. So I think that's going to be a big issue for the, for the ANC even when they go to the 2019 national elections. All right. Let's now go to Sekunda and Mabuto is there. Very good afternoon to you, Mabuto. Afternoon, how are you? Great. How are you? What's in your mind? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. It, it, it's very important for that, uh, for that unit chief to, ANC to have after the conference because... If they carry on doing exactly the same thing that happened uh, in Polokwane, it's going to destroy the ANC. Because it's not about the ANC, it's not about the person, the personal individual, it's about the ANC. If they need to, to win the elections in 2019, they don't have to, 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 to if you lose, then now you are going to go and open your own uh, uh, a political party. It's not going to work like that. If Sri Ramaphosa loses, he must accept it and come back to the to, to the party so that they can work towards uh, 2019. What's very important is 2019. That's what we need. All right, Mabuto, thank you so much for your call. That is Mabuto the, uh, from Secunda. Now, Professor, let's talk a bit more about the issue of branches. Nominations, we, we do know, um, about a decade ago were done at the provincial general councils, but now power has since been devolved at the lowest uh, party structures, that is the branches. Just what makes them so important? Oh, you know, they are the direct representatives of the membership, and the ANC really wants to emphasize that they an organization of the people down going down to the grassroots. So that symbolical value, it is very important for the ANC to show that it's not a cliquish organization that's controlled from the top. But it's debatable whether that is really effective and really credible to do say that because we know and we've heard so much of potential bribery, a money exchanging hand delegates' votes may be bought. And we've heard that that is quite a widespread practice. And that means if once a delegate's vote is bought, that person is not necessarily a representative of that branch anymore. And then power is again being devolved away from the branches. Another reason why I also say it is not that the branches may be central, but there are so many other structures and layers in the ANC that determine who the leader is going to be. For example, at the province, Provincial General Council, yes, they open and they count and it says uh, the nominations from the branches and there it is really f first past the post. The winner is the province's nomination really and that is guaranteed to that person to be on the ballot, either nomination by a branch or by one of the three leagues. And then of course from co at conference could be another nomination from conference floor if 25% of the delegates at a conference decide they want this person, then it, it, that is also an override of the branches. And of course, just the mere campaigning and the big agendas, whether it's economic policy or not, but ma as you said very accurately, much more the issue of corruption and state corruption and showing that there is a new and alternative ANC out there. Those are big debates that are also conducted in the branches, but very often they come from top down. So yes, the branches are central. But there are so many other layers in the ANC that also count in determining who the leader and leadership generally ultimately are going to be. Sure. Right, we've also got John from on the line from the Wildlands. A very good afternoon to you, John. Hi, John. Hi, guys. How are you? Great. How are you? Talk to me. All right, man. And I, I will just support the first caller from Nelspirit when uh, he told us that, you know, the ANC must unite for what? You know, that's a big question mark. They must unite for nothing. After what we see with the civil society rising against Jacob Zuma and how the ANC supported Jacob Zuma, 
the ANC is just fighting his own foolish battle between themselves. They lost the battle. They lost the people of South Africa. You know, we are falling from the ground here. We are the, the, the boot soldiers. You know? And we're saying that people lost faith in the ANC. With the conference or without conference, the people are gone. The support base of ANC is gone. They, they are traitors for the people. Zuma is still there. The rent is down. We have been downgraded 200 times already. And the, and the ANC is just fighting for a pace lift today. They're fighting for positions. They're, they're fighting for lifestyle, for, for house allowance, for car allowance, for medical aid. That's what they're fighting for. Thank you very much, guys. All right. Thanks so much for your call, John. John is basically saying that unity within ANC is just a myth. Look, I think what, what has historically kept the ANC together has, has, has been this principle that we, as long as you, you, you move together, it's not around particular moral issues or political, or rather moral issues, but as long as you can find unity and move together united. I think that's, that's been, in a sense, a moral compass for the ANC. But also the ANC has identified itself as, as a, a, again, a, a liberation project, but also a mass-based organization as well. Is, is the ANC still united on those principles in terms of the project that it's supposed to do, in terms of what we're seeing in terms of radical economic transformation? No, I think there are obviously differences there. But is there a possibility for the ANC to unite post this conference? Yes, there is. Uh, but part of the bigger problem with the ANC is that it is not going after the people who are doing wrong. So there isn't no any imposition of rule of law in the, in the party and in government. So people can you know, um, undermine the, their own rules in government, undermine the constitution of the ANC, and it's okay because no, nobody does actually anything about it. Because what we quite see as well at the ANC, NEC, is that they're quite compromised to be able to take a much more firm decision over what has been happening with, with the court pronouncing on the decisions or part of actions of this official or this minister and so on and so forth. So I don't think there has been any clear directive as to what the ANC should be doing. And I think that's part of the compromised nature. But unity can still be found in my view. But I'm not quite sure that this elective conference is going to do that for the ANC. All right. Now, Professor, some political thought leaders are saying that this conference will be a battle of ideas, a battle of ideologies and, uh, and policies. Now, at this point, we do know what Nkosana Jamini Zuma stands for, and we know what Cyril Ramaphosa stands for. So, if you believe, or, or rather, if, um, you know, if you support Nkosana Jamini Zuma, you're essentially believing that white monopoly capital is the real enemy. And, on the other hand, if you support Ramaphosa, you're saying you believe that corruption is the real adversary. You know, if only Nkosana Jamini Zuma would actually come out and participate in a public debate, well, then we would actually find out to what extent she really does believe in radical economic transformation. We've heard of a few utterances, all of you are also a few utterances by some of her minders around her, but she herself has said preciously little. And it is official policy. Radical economic transformation is official policy of the ANC. It was reiterated at the policy conference in the middle of the year, and they have said that so many times over the years. Okay, and they have given a specific interpretation to it, and the interpretations now they continue giving it is to elevate, to advance, improve, um, sharpen some aspects of that policy. And, but there is really no evidence that Pravin Godan, listen to his, think back to his budget speech early this year, he had a very articulate uh, positioning there of how radical all the ANC's economic policies have been over the years. And Cyril Ramaphosa follows in that and initiates several debates all around on that front. But I really do not, I'm not convinced that there is a serious ideological difference between the two major factions of the ANC. Not at all. And so what remains, the other issue around which the debates are and the factions organized is action against corruption. And then Cyril Ramaphosa and his camp have been prepared to make some pretty strong stance. Because Zanat Lamini Zuma is prepared from what I gather that yes, don't do corruption, we cannot, we must change this path. But there has been too many silences on what to do, how to correct what had gone wrong in the past decade. All right. Let's now go to Toyando and Tsakani is there. Very good afternoon to you, Tsakani. Good afternoon. Great. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Can you hear me? Ah, the line is uh, 
Absolutely diabolical. Let's now continue with the conversation. Now, uh, what has delayed, uh, you know, the the holding of the, you know, the branch general meetings? Look, obviously, there are, there are a couple of reasons that I would suppose, obviously, here. Part of the part of the problem is that obviously regions must be able to officiate the PGMs. Sometimes deployees are not going there. Obviously, sometimes um, PGMs are not able to find or to courage rather. So you need obviously 50% plus one of the people being there for it to be a legitimate PGM. So obviously, I'm sure there's a much more wider array of, of, of reasons as well. Some of them nefarious, some of them quite not right, given that people have vested interest in the outcomes of PGMs as well. Obviously, it's a national conference. And I think it was quite important important for the ANC then to extend it also given the two week dispute mechanism that they've given branches so if there's a problem with the BGM you then have two weeks to lodge a dispute with whether this BGM was right whether the officials that came in did the right thing and so on and so forth so I think it also gives the ANC quite a lot of time before December that they're able to resolve on these issues before the elective conference itself then becomes a problem that to the point where it's not able to sit or that it would even be disputed to post the conference so I think it's but important. Lodging the disputes uh, how has that impacted on the smooth running of the BGMs? Look, I, I, I've, I've not looked at, the, at that in terms of what has been the outcome of all of that. I think the disputes are still ongoing, particularly when you look at Mpumalanga, when you look at Northwest and, and, and the Free State as well. Now it looks like the Free State is going to the PGC. So I think there's going to be also some disputes coming from there, as we've, we've, we've seen in other provinces as well, looking at KZN. So I think once we, have a, uh, once we get closer to the elective conference, we'll have a much more bigger picture of what's happening or what has happened with the disputes, particularly around the BGMs. All right. Now, Professor, if the figures that have been coming through are anything to go by. Uh, we, we do gather that four provinces are supporting Kozadan Lamizuma and the other four are supporting Siru Zamaposa. But then there's only one mystery province, that is Mpumalanga. Is uh, David Mabuza the kingmaker? Well, he is a kingmaker, yes, provided he can have unity. His motto, his slogan, he can get that from the branch delegates from the province. And that we are waiting to see whether he can mobilize that. But as we've seen from specific branches, the nominations coming in, there's quite a big divide in that province as well, a big balance between the two major candidates. And so but David Mabuza is holding back because he is negotiating the best possible position for him. He really wants to be deputy president and I have heard it from very good sources in the province interviews that I did that he actually is afraid that he might be dumped, quote unquote, at Lutuli House. His words, not mine, uh, because he wants to be in his very senior position in the national government. And he's obviously holding out and trying to see who will give him the best guarantees that he could be on that slate. But of course, in a later of announcements by the ANC about the type of voting that they will do, that at the conference they will first vote for the president and that the results will be announced and then there will be chance for, for the losing candidate or for others from the floor to be nominated. That could also unsettle David Mabuse's plans to or his hopes and aspirations to come in as deputy president because that will be action from the floor. So it is a kingmaker but in the end that could fizzle out and I I think it could be quite evenly divided in the votes that come from the delegates between the two main camps for presidential candidate and then the rest of the candidates top six or possibly many, not many more, two more extended top structures that would be largely determined from mutual lobbying from the floor of the conference. So, Professor, the, the breaking away with the tradition that of the abolishment of slate politics, do you think it's a bona fide decision, you know, to avert the division along certain lines, or is it just a decision or is it just a trait, you know, of aligning a certain faction to hold on to power no matter what the outcome? I think it is a serious attempt to try to get unity. Don't know whether it'll be successful, but to try to elevate the chances to get unity post the conference, to break up those rigid slates. And if, if those slates are broken up, then there's a less chance of a split away. For better or for worse, based on this chance of this breakaway split after the conference, because the ANC knows so much actually depends at, on, this, on the ANC's future in elections. In, at previous conferences, the ANC still had a huge electoral buffer. They had well into the 60% of the national vote 
to a close 69.69 percent of the national vote when they went into Polokwane conference. Right. Now we know by national projections of previous election results they could be slippy. They are sitting at 52 to 56 okay. percent if all goes well, but not if it is Zuma as the ANC that emerges from the conference, and if it's Zuma as the ANC that is afflicted by another breakaway, then it is coalition politics and alliance politics very unstable. Field. Future, after the after future elections all around. Professor Poison and uh, Tapelo Telepedi, thank you so much to you two for joining us this afternoon. It's been a great pleasure. Well, that is question time for today. A big thank you to my guests and for you at home for watching. Till tomorrow then, have a great day. Bye-bye.